Evening, folks. Um, hello, welcome. Um, my name is uh, Alec Perry. I am an SAC consulting, uh, an SAC consultant working out of the SAC consulting office here in Auckland Grove in Ayrshire. And uh, um, this is a Managing Slurry for Folks in a Hurry, a Farming and Water Scotland webinar series, and this is episode three. Tonight, I'm joined by SEPA's Stephen Field and SAC's Consulting's Seamus Donnelly, and we're going to be discussing wet weather contingency planning, store maintenance, um, and safety around slurry. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague Seamus Murphy, who will be moderating our Q&A session in the back end of this evening. And uh, if you, anybody has any technical issues, you can relay them to us through the chat. Um, so uh, firstly, uh, we'll go over to Mr. Stephen Field, uh, as I mentioned, uh, working with uh, SEPA, the National Rural Units Manager. And he's gonna be talking a little bit about uh, store management, wet weather contingency planning, um, and kind of the outlook following the, uh, the recent consultation on slurry. Stephen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Alec. Can you hear me all? Yes. Perfect. Yep. Yep, hopefully. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, nice to be here this evening. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Uh, first of all, the, the kind of things that uh, we'll be covering tonight will be uh, looking at the maintenance of above ground stores, earth bank and concrete lagoons, slatted tanks, uh, reception pits, that sort of thing, and then a quick uh, introduction look at how you can cope. Uh, with uh, prolonged periods of wet weather, uh, which we do get uh, quite a bit in Scotland. Uh, first of all, I probably should have given you a bit more of an introduction. Uh, I actually am. Uh, Alex has given me a, a, an indication. I'm Stephen Field. I'm Secrets National Rural Unit Manager. Uh, I've been involved in agricultural regulation for the last 27 years, uh, working in uh, various uh, parts of Scotland, uh, mainly in the, in the southwest, in the Ayrshire and the East Galloway area. Uh, I have a team that work for me now, a team of 14 folk, uh, and they are responsible for one-to-one -one engagement with land managers on the ground. And they are looking at uh, the quality and uh, the, the structures uh, that farmers use with regards to the site storage of storage, or even uh, the making of silage uh, and that sort of stuff in the storage of FYM. So uh, maintenance for us is, uh, is very, very important. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, uh, there's a couple of things, uh, just to, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and, and hopefully uh, we'll get some hands raised uh, just to give us a, an indication uh, of who's in the audience this evening. Uh, the first thing I'd like to know is, uh, is how many active farmers do we have? If you're an active farmer, it would be good if you could raise your, raise your hand. Uh, don't be scared, I'm not going to. Are we getting anybody, Alec? Uh, yeah, I can see that we have we have six uh, six hands going up there. That's lovely. That's lovely. Uh, that's a good start. Uh, of of those farmers, uh, how many would uh, service their car annually? Stick your hands up if you do that. And we've got another six there. Seven. Yep. Seven. No, we're the nice. person. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the seven farmers, how many would service your tractor and your silage wagon prior to silage making? Five. Five. Okay. Six. 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 So there's somebody's going to, the seventh one will come in a minute. I'm going to ask the question now how many would undertake a routine inspection of a slurry store or a silage pit? Mm -hmm. Three. Okay, no, that's it. just it's just to give me an indication and a, a feeling uh, of uh, you know, what, what farmers uh, think of uh, maintenance. Uh, you know, the question that we're asking is: Is there a requirement or a need to maintain structures? Well, from the safest perspective, and I think uh, from uh, a farmer's perspective, yes, there is a need uh, to maintain structures and to ensure that they're that they're impermeable. But why would you do that? Well, first of all, the, the installation of a slurry store. Uh, or a lagoon or a pupil house with static passage. It's a major investment. It's a, a one in a generation expenditure on the farm. Uh, and you want to be able to maintain that structure as long as it's physically possible. Uh, the SAFA regulations, they talk about uh, these structures having a, a minimum design life 
of uh, 20 years uh, with what they call routine repair and maintenance. Now that that that's key, uh, that routine repair and maintenance to ensure you get that minimum of 20 years design. The other thing that's interesting is I, I don't know if it's when you look at the small printed manufacturers uh, when they're selling the, the material, the manufacturers of lagoons and of steady stores require routine maintenance and inspection to maintain the warranty and the structure. And that's something that uh, probably a lot of farmers maybe aren't fully aware of. And uh, there is, they should actually provide you with an inspection handbook. And they do offer various different services in terms of carrying out animal type inspections. And the other reason for maintaining structures is to make sure to, to, to minimize the likelihood of a failure. Because any failure will be financially damaging and will have a financial impact and also will an impact on the, on the environment. So there is a, a real necessity uh, and need to uh, ensure that the uh, routine repair and maintenance and inspection is carried out at these particular facilities. Next slide, please. Okay. As I, as I said previously, uh, a, a properly constructed slurry store, uh, whether it be a lagoon, whether it be a slatted passage, whether it be a concrete above ground store or even a, an, uh, an enamel uh, steel store, should have a minimum uh, design life of 20 years. That's what the, the British standards require to have. Uh, and that is again with the routine repair and maintenance. However, uh, structures do fail, and some of them fail when they're very, very young. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is ensure that the lifespan of the structure is maintained. Uh, where, you know, SEPA is involved and has been involved recently with a number of stores, uh, some stores, sorry, lagoons that have failed. Uh, and you know they have had uh, con consequences with the environment, but also some of these have had to be condemned and structures rebuilt. And the main thing that uh, you look at in the, the lifespan of the structure is dependent on various different aspects. It, we need to know what the quality of the materials and the components which are being used, uh, the care and the quality of the people that are building it uh, to ensure that it's built to the right standards. They're following the design, they're following an engineer's uh, specification and of course, building to the, the British standards. Uh, the, in, in terms of maintaining uh, the lifespan of the store, there's things that can happen during damage and emptying. Uh, you, you think you, you need to look at, especially lagoons, uh, where the filling and emptying mechanically, uh, if not carried out properly, can actually cause a rip or a tear in it. So, uh, you know, you want to be looking at uh, what's happening when you're actually filling and emptying particular structures. Uh, mechanical damage can occur to the exterior of uh, above ground stores, especially in apple stores, uh, uh, steel stores, uh, and also lagoons. So we, these things do happen. Um, what we would say and what we do look at and suggest to people is that regular inspection and maintenance is required. If you notice damage to a structure, don't put that uh, repair or damage off to another day. Please uh, look at it and uh, repair it as soon as possible. And as I said, uh, by carrying out routine repair and maintenance on structures, you can preserve the safe working life of these structures beyond 20 years. You know, we are aware and I'm aware of plenty of study stores out there that are 30 years old that have been maintained well. Uh, they've uh, come across uh, a problem that they've repaired near enough immediately and they've uh, maintained the, the working life of that particular structure. Next slide, please. Okay. We're going to look at uh, what do we mean by uh, routine repair and maintenance? What is actually meant by that? How often and when? And what should we be looking for? And how can it be repaired? So, what I'll do is I'll go through a couple of examples. Uh, we look at a ground store, uh, maybe talk about a concrete store at the same time, uh, lagoons, and that sort of thing, and what, what we should be looking for. In, in essence, uh, maintenance and uh, some of the warranties that uh, manufacturers have. And, uh, there's a there's a document that was written by Syria. It's a construction manual, design manual for agricultural structures, and it talks about maintenance being on an annual basis for the exterior of above ground stores, uh, basically above ground lagoons or uh, story stores. And you know that that that's that's interesting from my perspective because we look at various things when we go out on the ground uh, and and look at the just. The, the state of the stores and uh, you know examine maybe what problems actually are before you come across a problem. So in essence they they're looking externally at uh, above ground story stores 
uh, recommend an inspection externally once a year uh, and internally of an outgoing store uh, maybe once in five years and that's very very difficult and we do have to take into consideration uh, health and safety issues when looking at the inside of uh, story stores but wow what, what are we looking for uh, when we make an inspection of a, an outgoing steel store well basically what we're looking at is we're looking to see if there's any chips in the enamel uh, if there's any indication of rust around bolts if there's any what, we, what i look for is a, a like an oily sheen appearing uh, between the bolts and the panel with electrolytic corrosion uh, the quality of the mask or the sealant is there. Uh, we also look at the join between the, the concrete base and the first ring uh, and the ground sequences along those particular areas. Uh, one thing to keep to bear in mind is that around story stories, you should try and keep uh, uh, shrubs, nettles, and that sort of stuff away from the, this particular area. And, uh, if you've got any trees growing in uh, close proximity, they, can just be removed. they should be removed. Uh, because their roots can actually impinge on the, the structure of the, the concrete itself. So, you know, that there's those are the sort of things that we're looking at. Say, for example, the kind of, the kind of repairs you could carry out, say you come across a small pinhole, uh, there are things that you can use a, a nut and bolt of mastic uh, to see that sort of thing, or you can actually uh, put plates on the, the steel panel, uh, the silicon between it, to resolve those particular problems. Uh, if there's just a small chip in the enamel, and that can occur quite easily from a bit of uh, gravel or a stone on the yard being uh, thrown up from the tractor wheel. Uh, that can be covered, cleaned and covered with uh, mastic and that uh, maintains the, the lifespan of that particular facility because it, uh, it prevents the rust occurring uh, in that particular area. The inside of the store can become damaged, especially if uh, you get a little bit of grit off the, the cattle's feet uh, and it's mixed with a the stirring and you're jetting up and over. Uh, we always recommend that you don't uh, fire the jet onto the side wall of your uh, slurry store, try and jet it into the middle. Uh, and it's always not practical and uh, things do happen, but uh, those sort of chips can occur inside as well. Uh, and that's why uh, you really want to be looking internally uh, in the store maybe once every five years. That would only be when it's fully totally emptied and probably cleaned a little bit to actually see those particular things. Uh, but those are the sort of uh, routine type of maintenance jobs that a farmer can do on the ground. If a panel uh, was severely damaged, then it's a little bit more intricate and in what needs to be done. Uh, and that's where your manufacturer can come in. Because uh, with a thing like a store store or a burn perma store, each panel is uh, has a number and they can manufacture that panel to the exact same size and dimensions. Uh, the other thing that we look at, as I said earlier, was the, the, the quality of the mastic. And if the mastic is uh, crumbly and brittle, then it's a good indication that it's time for that to be replaced. Uh, and again, the manufacturer can do that, or you can do that yourself uh, just by removing and replacing it. Uh, so those are the things that we would look at in a bug ground store if we work in the ground. Our concrete stores, uh, bug ground concrete stores, are a bit more difficult. Uh, you're, you're just basically looking for uh, possibly areas of leakage. Uh, there is straining, uh, steel straining. Uh, wires that go around it, they sometimes become quite slack uh, and if you do get a bit of leakage, it might be as a result of those slacking off. Now that is a job for a manufacturer to, to, to tighten those. Uh, they are under a lot of tension and it's better done by experts. But it's, it's just looking to, to ensure and, and keep an eye on any, uh, any seepage that may be arising from those particular areas. One area that uh, on slurry stores, on older slurry stores is the reception pit stroke uh, valve system the double sluice valve they do become damaged over a number of years and uh, sometimes we're on farms uh, i've noticed that uh, maybe there's only one of the two valves in operation uh, i would always recommend um, uh, looking at replacing or repairing damaged sluice valves as soon as possible uh, because you really can't rely on the one uh, if it does lock open then it does get a problem so those are the sort of things that we're looking at, just the condition of those when we're out and those are the sort of things uh, farmers should be looking at once a year. Uh, as I say, just ensuring that any bits of damage is, is repaired as, as quickly as possible. So that kind of covers uh, above ground uh, slurry stores. When it comes to lagoons, uh, lagoons are land lagoons that have come onto the scene quite quickly within Scotland. And uh, 
it really comes down to quality of the build in the first place and then uh, routine maintenance. With liners, uh, when you talk to the good manufacturers, they, uh, they tell you that the wind blow and branches and uh, bits of debris can actually uh, cause rips uh, in the liner itself. And uh, also any mechanical damage can occur. We, we're, we're aware that contractors sometimes maybe aren't the, the, I wouldn't say the tidiest of people on the ground, but maybe are quite rough and ready and uh, would throw their uh, vacuum tanker or the pump over the edge that any coupling in that can create damage. And we have uh, noticed uh, quite a few lagoons with rips and uh, that sort of thing. Lagoon maintenance is very similar to above ground stores. The lagoon manufacturers would suggest that uh, you take a, an annual inspection again, both of uh, ground conditions and also of the liner itself, visually the liner from the top uh, to see what it's actually like. With lagoons, some of the biggest problems can be from rodents, from rabbits and rats. Uh, for some reason, rabbits love burrowing into the lagoon walls, so do rats. Uh, fortunately, rats also like fighting through the liner. Uh, so one thing uh, we would always suggest looking at or farmers to look at is uh, the, the evidence of rodents in and around the lagoon area. Uh, and if they do see it, uh, some kind of uh, rodent removal and uh, repair those, uh, those holes that do appear uh, because they do any holes with a, any any lagoon which has been built above ground and not actually into the ground any holes made by rodents uh, can cause uh, instability and can initially start erosion of those uh, surface areas uh, therefore that can then cause a bank slump so uh, early maintenance in those particular areas and look for those particular things will actually uh, uh, you know, uh, maintain the lifespan of that particular structure. Uh, so that's that's that, that's where we are with liners. Uh, they are, as I said, vulnerable to uh, damage, and we, we really need to, to look at those uh, over the long term. So they do. Uh, other areas that we would always always recommend below ground stores uh, in terms of static tanks are very very hard to uh, inspect, and uh, you know. <clears throat> They only can really be inspected by a qualified person with the right uh, equipment. Uh, what we would suggest is that once the stores are completely open or completely cleared of slurry or emptied of slurry, which may happen maybe once a year, uh, if you've a slat up or mixing area, just to have a look at the condition of the inside wall from the surface, just using a torch to see if you have any evidence of cracks or any evidence of uh, getting a pop of holes starting in the concrete. With some structures, the, some of those cubicles can be quite a quite an age, and the slatted passages can be quite an age. There might be a brick built or a double block with a rendered face. Uh, the rendering can become damaged over a period of time, and you can usually see that quite easily uh, just by the removal of a slab. Uh, you can usually see that whether the renders cracked or damaged. And if that, that is the case, then you, you know we could probably look into plan uh, a more a larger repair of those particular structures. Uh, in the, in the but they are they are a wee bit more difficult and as I say there is the issue of uh, gases and that's why uh, Seamus will probably touch on that uh, and the poisonous nature of those particular gases uh, and moving forward. Concrete uh, lagoons, uh, they are quite easy, above them the concrete lagoons are quite easy to inspect. Uh, you just have to basically uh, do a visual walk around and look for any evidence of uh, seepage, uh, usually between where you've got an itch beam and the concrete, uh, those particular areas. Uh, the inside of those, you'll, as you empty in the lagoon, you'll probably see any damage occurring, uh, which has occurred, and they can be repaired quite easily just by a covering of concrete again. Uh, but in essence, you know, a, a well maintained uh, above ground concrete lagoon with routine repair maintenance can last as much as 40 odd years. Uh, if built properly in the first place. So uh, you know, just uh, keeping an eye on things does maintain the, the safe working life of those particular structures. Uh, I think next slide, please. I think that we covered uh, most of the areas. But if there's any questions in, the, in any other structure, we can, we can talk about that at the end. Thank you. Okay, that, that uh, kind of covers uh, maintenance of study stores uh, and uh, routine inspection and the reasons behind it. 
Uh, what, are, what we're looking at, uh, wanted to look at a wee bit was uh, basically planning for prolonged uh, wet weather, uh, sort of contingency planning and building and trying to get farmers to think more about uh, contingency plans and preparing contingency plans, whether uh, for, uh, say, a burst of a slurry store or something like that, just like, like, what can you do or what happens during uh, prolonged periods of poor Scottish wet weather. And the reason for that, uh, forward planning is essential um, if we want to get what, the best of the nutrient value of the slurry uh, and to avoid uh, having to apply slurries uh, in inappropriate conditions or given rise to uh, pollution incidents by overtopping the stores and stuff like that. Slurry is a very valuable resource uh, and we, we need to promote more about the nutrient value of the slurry and the benefits of it. And, you know, it probably has been discussed in previous uh, <clears throat> webinars, just the, the value of uh, slurry uh, in relation to an organic fertilizer. And, uh, you know, most of the calculations would indicate that a 10 meter cube tanker is probably a value of between, depending on the price of uh, an organic fertilizer at the time, between 30 and 50 pounds uh, of equivalent uh, an organic fertilizer. Now that, that is, uh, you know, we want to farmers to get the best of that so they don't have to buy more inorganic and apply onto the land uh, and lose the benefit uh, of that inorganic. The other thing is in terms of uh, wet weather planning and uh, contingency planning, the sample regulation, that's the control of pollution, sadly showing agricultural fuel oil regulations, since 1991 have required 180 days slurry storage. Uh, they talk about 180 days in wintering period within the regulations. Uh, and also now the general binding rules, which were introduced in 2008, they prevent the application of slurry to land, which is waterlogged, frozen, or snow covered. Uh, with those two sets of regulations being in place, it does limit the number of times during the winter uh, for safe application and best use of slurry. Uh, and, you know, it, it's really looking at uh, getting farmers to think about applying slurry at the best times, February sometimes onwards into March, and to get the, the best value of that particular uh, commodity. And, you know, we would, as an organization, recommend 22 weeks, which is actually less than the 180 days in wintering, uh, to get the best value uh, from the story and uh, enable application during uh, good periods. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so you actually, when, when you're looking at the planning or trying to get contingencies uh, or slurry and trying to get the best out of the, the slurry storage you have on the farm. Uh, the big question is, and the big thing to try and do is maximize the space in the existing slurry storage that you have on the farm. Excuse me. And one thing that we would always recommend and we always talk to farmers about when we're out doing inspections is where does your clean water go from your roof and from your yard area? Does it need to be collected? Possibly not. Uh, if you're a beef unit, maybe you do need a little bit of water in your slurry. Uh, a dairy, probably no water, excess clean water is needed to go into the story. So you should always be looking to try and remove that um, from yard areas which may have to drain to into your story store. And I think we'll give a, an example here. Uh, an inch of rain falling on a, an acre of roof, and you know, an acre of, you, <laughs> that could be a, a large cubicle house in these days, uh, will generate about 20,000, 27,000 gallons on average. Uh, that's a lot of water uh, that would. Uh, if not drained away from your slurry store, it ends up going in there and reducing your slurry store capacity. So, in essence, when you're looking for contingencies and uh, you know looking at those wet water periods that may come, let's think about trying to remove all that clean water that doesn't need to be going to slurry stores uh, and the amount of yards that go to slurry stores. Uh, that's one thing. And the good thing to do is, if you want, you can do that yourself. You can do that using the four point plan, which is available on the Farming and Water Scotland website. And that gives you a plan to undertake a calculation of uh, what's coming off your yard area and what is designated as a dirty yard and what is clean. And then you can shed the clean water uh, into existing field tile unit systems or into a field. The other thing that uh, is worth considering uh, to maximize the space within your story store is the, the use of uh, constructive farm weapons uh, to treat. What, we're, what we term lightly contaminated drainage. Now, what we think by lightly contaminated drainage is uh, winter runoff from silage pits. Uh, so when the clamps opened, 
and the rainfall coming into contact with the floor pit and the base of the clamp. That water, well, it's probably just dirty water, but it does have a quite a high bio, biological oxygen demand, uh, can be drained to a constructive form weapon for treatment. Runoff from mittens can go to a similar location. Uh, and there are other areas where you've got probably vehicle movements, which are likely soil, you can also drain to a constructive form weapon. Just by removing uh, the, the winter runoff from a silage pit or a twin base silage pit uh, on most farms could give you one to maybe one and a half rings additional capacity within your slurry storage system. So you could have a slurry store present which has maybe four months slurry storage by removing excess clean water and by removing uh, dirty water to a contaminated or constructive farm weapon scenario. You could get way above the 22 weeks closer to the six month requirement. So it, it, in essence, what we're trying to get farmers to think about is maximizing the space within your story story system. Okay, thank you. I'm just keeping an eye on the time here, so I give Seamus plenty of time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, in essence, in the next couple of slides we, we can go through quite quickly. And I've talked about why we want to maximize the, the storage within uh, the space within your story store and how we can do that. And basically, it's keeping clean and dirty areas separate, uh, using things like sleeping placement to separate two areas, setting the clean water away, uh, looking at the gutters and the downpipes and in the right your setting area, where is that drainage going to? Is it falling onto contaminated yards? Could we put a, a downpipe onto a root row and take it down to drain and get that water away? Get the clean water away from your system as quickly as possible. Uh, so those are the sort of things Parlor washings, we do need to connect with your dairy system. Uh, so just that, that has to be uh, thought about. But you know, you can use different types of hoses. Uh, you can change the high pressure hose to reduce the, the volume of the volume that's actually there. Okay, next slide, please. And the other things that uh, are good to know for a contingency and uh, if, if we do have prolonged periods of weather is to understand how much really actually produce. Uh, what the capacity of your tanks actually are uh, around the farm. Uh, you know, how many days storage do you reckon you have left? And uh, we have got to remember there is a requirement for feed board on slurry stores, above ground facilities, uh, above ground stores in 300 millimeters, and if you've got no point, you're going at 750 millimeters free board. So it's just uh, reminding yourselves about that uh, and taking that into play. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's, it's really trying to understand what capacity you have within your tank system, how much slurry you actually produce during that day uh, from your, your herd of cattle, uh, and what that means in terms of weeks and what that means in terms of tanker systems. Uh, understand if uh, you may look to see if you've got neighbours uh, that maybe aren't using slurry storage systems anymore, maybe have uh, stopped farming and rented the land out. Uh, is there the potential in the prolonged periods of wet weather to uh, take slurry to those particular facilities? Or is there an idea of another in uh, close proximity to you that would actually take slurry during the work of the period? So it's just understanding that there's any other outlets out there that you can put into a contingency to take uh, slurry uh, to other locations. Uh, the other area that we would always uh, recommend farmers have, do and undertake is for the production of a rams map, which will identify low, medium, and high areas of uh, spreading risk and uh, would actually. Uh, indicate areas that maybe were more waterlogged uh, and that sort of thing, but you also have to note the, the general boundary of those when you water like frozen snow covered ground. Uh, and the other thing that we would all say is that there is certain growing seasons. Some people would probably argue that uh, grass grows all year round. Uh, it may do uh, in certain parts, but not really in Scotland. And if we're having to apply slurry out with what we would call the growing season, then to plan that and put that in place and then to, to apply that safely. But keep the, the quantity in terms of uh, how much you're going to spread active at a minimum rate uh, so that it uh, doesn't give rise to runoff uh, during maybe a wet weather period after that. Uh, so that's really what we're looking at. We're trying to think about uh, getting farmers to put contingency plans together and we're also trying to promote uh, farmers looking at the routine repair and maintenance on the slurry stores and other structures on the farm. Thank you.
All right. Um, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I just, uh, we're, we're just about to move on to, to Seamus um, for, for his discussion on farm safety. Um, just want to remind anybody that's listening, um, if, uh, if you could um, or if you do have any questions that you want to ask either Seamus or Stephen, um, please throw them into the Q&A and uh, we'll, we'll get to that um, just after Seamus. Um, but uh, Seamus, are you ready to go? I'm ready if you can hear me. Good stuff. Yeah, no, you're good coming stuff. through absolutely fine. So good. here we go. That's fine. Well, good evening. Thanks, Alex, for inviting me to come along tonight. I'll just set the scene. I work as a general advisor down in the Schnarr office. Uh, that area has got an awful lot of livestock, just an awful lot of shite. I have been told in the past that I talk a lot about shite, which is better than talking a lot of shite. Uh, but the background is in the last 10 years, we've really seen a lot of slurry stores going up uh, in this area. We've had a lot of good support from SEPA and also the department. If we went back to 2010 up to 2015, you remember the RTP grant scheme. In that period, we saw 80, tank, 80 stores being built and there was a variation. 40% would have been lagoons, 20% would steel stores, 16% concrete above ground stores, and the remainder, which is about 26%, was slatted tanks. So a variety at that point. Since 2015, uh, the number of tanks going up, you could say we maybe built enough, uh, but there are still areas that are needing extra tanks. We've seen about 30 go up in that time, and they're probably holding about 15 million gallons in total. Uh, Stephen alluded to the fact that they're pushing hard for a minimum of 22 weeks. I come from Northern Ireland, and 40 years ago, we were looking for a minimum storage of six months because it rained whenever you wanted to put the slurry out. So we felt we would better to store it and then put it on at the start of the spring uh, and get the maximum benefit out of that. Um, he mentioned a very good figure and always say to farmers whenever trying to convince them to do things around the stead. And you've, uh, if you have a shed that's 100 foot by 40 and the rainwater is coming off that and going onto a yard and getting contaminated and then you have to quite rightly go and collect that and put it in your store, that 100 foot by 40 foot shed roof over the winter is equivalent to you having to deal with 40 tanker loads of slurry, extra slurry at the end of the, the winter, simply from getting rid of that. So just think of at 100 foot by 40 foot, 40 loads of slurry. So the first thing I always say to people is try and separate the clean water from the potential dirty water. Uh, right, my purpose tonight is to talk a wee bit about the safety involved in handling slurry all the way along. It's a subject that's close to my heart. I was counting up there, it was about 47 years ago. I don't maybe look young enough, old enough to be uh, that age, but 47 years ago, myself and my brother, we built a slatted tank, a cubicle shed, and it had a suspended uh, slatted tank in the middle. It was a good shed, it's still standing. Uh, I have to confess, we don't go in that often to, to check whether, the, whether there's any leakages, but it would be a peer there isn't. But whenever we built it, we made the mistake, we couldn't drive through it, and there's one area of the shed where we always have to pump water in, and then we get it with a whisk. And I can think not only did we get it with a whisk, in days gone by, we'd have stood and watched the whisk operating and thinking how well, or we could smell a bit, of how well are we doing that? We're getting it all broken down. And that, over the years, I've just realized just how dangerous that is. And the purpose tonight is to try and point out some of these dangers. I read that uh, in Chagas in the south of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, they said in the last 10 years in Ireland, 20, 21 people lost their lives due either to slurry drowning or gassing. That was 10% of all the deaths on farms in that period. Slurry drowning, you might pose the question, what happens there? Well, it's not often, and in that period, I think six or seven people actually died simply through drowning. They would collapse and fall into the tank. More recently in Northern Ireland, uh, in 2012, you've probably all been aware of the case, Nevin Spence, who was a, an up and coming rugby player who played for Ulster, who had high hopes for him going into the Ireland team. And him and his, he was home helping his father and brother and they were cleaning out or pumping out some slurry. And something happened and he opened the lid and I think one of them went down. He got gassed and the father and brother also got gassed. Three people died out of that family. More recently, up close to where I'm from originally, in a wee place called Dunloy, in 2014, there was a young eight-year-old boy who was gassed. He'd gone in to help his father. He was just standing watching his father pumping slurry. 
Uh, and as recently as two years ago, we almost lost a very good, a good friend and a good farmer down in the Sonari area. He almost died. And I'll explain a wee bit more what actually happened in that. So it is a real, a real danger. Okay, Alex, next slide. I call it the silent assassin. We all know slurry tanks contain um, methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide. Hydrogen sulfide is something we may be not just so aware of. It's a, it's a very lethal gas. It's actually more lethal than hydrogen cyanide, which if you remember, well, was used if you read your history books in World War I to gas people. Hydrogen sulfide is even more lethal. You don't really smell it at high levels. What actually happens is your olfactory glands in the nose, which detects smell, get desensitized. So you actually don't realize at low levels, you smell it. We've all been aware of the, um, uh, rotten eggs and chemistry and that, the rotten smell of hydrogen, that's at very, very low levels. That might be only about one part per million. Once it goes above um, about 20, 40, 100, you lose, you lose that sense of smell. It is heavier than oxygen, and that also gives you an indication of where we're going to find it. We're going to find it at the, at the base of the floor or the ground level. And it also can very quickly go into the lungs and work, work the way down. If it's low levels at 20 to 150 parts per million, you get an irritation with your eyes. Around 200 parts per million, you might sense headache or dizziness. 500 parts per million, one breath could be fatal. It can cause nausea and you just collapse. And I'm told that 700 parts per million, breathing would stop. Now, next slide. When you start mixing your slurry, and that's really whenever uh, those emissions of hydrogen sulfide gas take off, uh, you can be up over a thousand parts per million. That's a good analogy. Somebody said it's a wee bit like what happens in a lemonade bottle. The gas is formed within the slurry, and while some gas may be bubbling to the surface, most of it remains dissolved in the same way as gas is held within a bottle of lemonade or fizzy drink. When the mixer starts working, the grass is released very quickly. You shake a bottle of lemonade, it gets released very quickly, and that gas just whoomph, comes to the surface, and usually around the mixing point. But it's also released in large quantities with a jet of slurry. You might be having a jet in and pushing it to one corner of a slatted tank, and you can get a, a higher emissions there as well. So it's not just, the high risk isn't just at the point of uh, stirring. It does gradually fall off, and but each time you go and shift the pump and move to another point to maybe get it mixed better, the same thing can arise. So it can be an ongoing. You might have been pumping, you think it's quite safe for half a day, and then you move the pump, you've got the same risk. So we have to plan how to stay safe. I had uh, recent experience. Next slide, please, Alex. Two cases in Stranara. We were talking about this about a year and a half ago, and I was talking to my brother. And he was saying to me, uh, oh, he says, uh, he says, you might have a point. He says, I was in one day and uh, uh, had to go back out of the shed. And whenever I came back in again, there had been a wee family of mice. They must have disturbed somewhere on the edge of the shed. He says, they were all lying dead. Well, he says, there must be gas kicking about. What we don't realise, because we can't see it, is just how lethal that gas can be. Um, in this first case, it was a farmer down in the scenario area. And he went to empty a slatted tank and he always mixed it before it. He'd been doing that for the last 15 years, the exact same way. For some reason, it might've been it was a calm day. It could be that there was more slurry in the actual tank and that brought it to, brought the, the um, hydrogen sulfide gas would actually rise a bit higher uh, and maybe up to his level. But anyway, he collapsed and it was around lunchtime and his, his son came back in from the field and said he could still hear the track to go. And he thought, that's strange. My dad would normally be in for his lunch. So he, he took a walk down into the shed and he could see his father lying collapsed. And he rushed in, big deep breath, and pulled them out, brought them out, and they phoned the ambulance. And the ambulance came and worked on him for two hours on the farm before they would even take him away. He was a lucky man. And it was just, a, just fortunate his, his son realized something was amiss. Afterwards, I spoke to the farmer and he said, I, he says, what actually happened? He says, I was mixing away. And he looked up and he said, 
I saw one of, one of the cats was lying flat out and he suddenly realized there's a problem here. And he says, I started to run for the door. And he says, I didn't make the door. So there's a couple of fundamental points. I'll talk about the safety issues. The second case was one we would always encourage people to have a draw-off point, start mixing from the draw-off point. Speaking to a farmer uh, last year, and he was saying, I, he says, I was doing that all right. Uh, but he says, I get into the habit. I was maybe been a bit lazy. I, I didn't bother shifting the cattle out of the shed. And he says, I went back in again after the finished mixing. And the first pen uh, of, fit, of bullocks they had in the shed inside were next to that mixing point. 11 bullocks were flat out dead. And the next pen down, two bullocks were flat out dead. So you just shows you get the animals out. Okay, next slide. So I think it's all about planning ahead. Logical, you try to mix in a windy day. You try to open all the doors and ventilations or uh, windows or whatever, but doors would be the main thing. I think it's critical you keep children away from the area and it's at all times when working with slurry. You never mind the mechanical aspects of props, uh, PTO guards and stuff. Think also about the danger of the smell. They won't see it. They're a wee bit lower to the ground. They may actually get pick up the, the gas before you get it. As I said, take all the animals out of the buildings. It's something I wouldn't have done. Maybe we wouldn't have done. Maybe so at home we would have risked it. Maybe after recent experiences, we're saying, no, get them out uh, before we start to mix the slurry. Begin with using your outside mixing points. Um, hopefully they'll, they'll have been put in whenever you design the, the shed. More modern sheds have that. You need a, need a couple of them down the outside. If you remove any slats, put in something that would prevent you falling back in. And you'd say, well, that can't be. If you collapse and you fall into the slurry, just remember in Ireland, six or seven people lost their lives from falling into the slurry tanks. Um, so you'd start the pump and mixer and then get out of the building and stay out for at least 30 minutes or longer, depending on the size of the tank. If you have to go into the building, make sure that another adult who knows what you're doing stays outside and you can get help if needed. If you need to go in to move the pump or change the direction of the pump, then leave as soon as you've done that and wait another 30 or 40 minutes. Next slide, please, Alec. Um, I put in one there, avoid naked flame. It's, it's inflammable. So don't stand, you wouldn't be standing in there smoking and watching the, the whisk of the pump going. Good idea to have your emergency services number in your mobile. Don't, we've all done it. Don't go into a slatted tank, especially whenever you're mixing and gases are being released. You're asking for trouble. We've had cases where people have been using gypsum lime for bed and cubicles and or even bed and sheep. And sometimes that can end up back inside your slatted tank or slurry tank inside along maybe an internal passageway or whatever. And that's not that watch that because you get extra sulfur gases getting given off coming in from the gypsum. Wouldn't be good practice to mix silage effluent into the tank for by it could ruin the side walls but also extra uh, gas has been given off. I spoke to a local contractor and he has equipped all his men with a gas monitor, but he says, we don't even look at that. Whenever we start mixing, we get out because it can quickly rise up to a level that by the time you're reading it, you're knocked out. But he says it's useful to go back in afterwards and just monitor it. And Spalding's do one, I've put it down there, H2S, hydrogen sulfide, single gas monitor, costs about 78 quid. Okay, next slide. So that's the kind of health side going into it. There's other risks, obviously, in storing slurry. Now, if you're storing it in lagoons, I've spoken to one guy and he said, um, it's always a good idea to, if you are going to put a fence around, make sure it's a fence that keeps animals, vermin, and children well away from the tank. They might be attracted to a big hole of water, if it's icy or snowy or whatever, but provide a decent fence. Um, we've had experiences where foxes have gone in and they've done a lot of damage on your slurry liner in the lagoon. Uh, I've also spoken to a fellow in Northern End who said, oh, he says, one day we were pumping away at slurry and we left the gate open. We were going down the ramp to draw the slurry out. We left the gate open and there's eight or nine cows went down into it, just walked down. Could we get them back out again? Um, in a case like that, always think ahead. If I was designing a lagoon, I want to design that I don't need to go in to actually bring the slurry out. I, I can do it all from behind the fence. 
and that leads me on to my next point, the poor design for getting slurry out. It's become fashionable, well, everyone thinks, because you put a wide wall around the top of the lagoon, that would not be an ideal place to go in and start mixing and drawing off. That wide wall is really there to stop the walls moving. You need about three metres, three and a half metres width at the top to give you enough weight to stop the lagoon moving once you've filled up, up with, with slurry. So it's not really designed that. Maybe the ends would be, but even then, think about the safety. I have a couple of pictures I'll show later. Um, think also about the poor maintenance. Um, Stephen brought up a good point about steel tanks. We've had cases with one where it leaked. I got a phone call one Sunday morning and the fellow said he'd, he'd, he'd sprung a leak on a tank and he carried out the right procedure. He phoned SEPA. He went and got a couple of big bales and dammed up near Shuck. So always have the contingency for that as well. But even before it happens, you will maybe get in a steel tank that's even as, as young as 20 years, telltale signs. And all you're looking for, if you can see daylight or a pinprick or a hole, a finger thing, that's enough for it to start rusting or start um, eroding and cause damage. So it is good practice to go in there and um, seal it with mastic and put a patch on. And down at the Crichton, Hugh McClimate, the farm manager, does that every year. And he has to do it every year. Um, if you're in an emergency and something does go, a farmer did say to me, start the pump and get it circulating because the straw in the slurry will actually help seal the small holes. But maintenance first and foremost. Next slide, please. Other risks spreading slurry, too high a rate. Um, I, in the days of going with 50 cube, um, we are seeing the most farmers, I think it's good practice, think about 30, 35 cube and going a couple of times. Um, 35 cube to the hectare is about uh, 3,000 gallons to the acre. We know we have to avoid if it's too wet, if there's snow on the ground, or if it's frosty, for fear of blanket runoff and just disappearing down onto, into ditches. We all know the guidelines for you must not spread within 10 metres of the top of a ditch or within 50 metres of spring well. Otherwise, you risk BSP and cross compliance and probably big fines for killing fish. So those are the other risks involved in spreading slurry and handling it. Next slide, please. I want to deal a wee bit more about health and safety. That's important. We've had a lot of farmers have put in lagoons and we say, right, fit a lockable gate. It's child and animal safe. Make the fence. By law, it should be not accessible for hand or foothold. But the height, whenever you look at building warrant, it only suggests it should be 1.1 metre high. And even health and safety, it should be a minimum 1.3 metre topped with two strand barbed wire. We have farmers down this neck of the woods have done the right thing and said, we're going for 1.8 to 2 metre chain link uh, because that'll keep kids out um, and it also keeps animals out. We can't jump over. Um, it's a good idea to have a safety barrier behind the gate or at filling points so the tractor doesn't reverse down into it. And you design, I think, to have a pump fill from outside the safety fence. And those are all things you can do in designing or you can retrofit a lot of these. By law, you should have a slurry sign saying that there's risk of gases and drowning. And you should have a means of escape, tires linked. We've seen that in a couple of farms eight years ago. And one farmer says to me, but says, do it with either polypropylene rope or chain. Because he says, I was going up one just after it was built and he says it was just come out uh, to get to the top of it there's no slurry in it and the tires uh the rope that was holding the tires broke and it fell back in but luckily there's no slurry in it so make sure if you are going to link tires which is a good idea uh so at least if you do are able to swim across the lagoon and get to the corner and you can get up and clamber up next slide please uh, Seamus, can I just ask, um, are, are you able to kind of uh, run through the next couple of slides, just conscious that we want to get I, a couple I'll just, of questions? I'll literally just, just through the slides go and go for it. I think it's all photos from now on in anyway. Okay, child preference, that's what we're wanting. Next. And that was about 22 to 35 pound. There's my crash barrier. So if you have a gate and you're putting the pump in over and you're putting that pump down onto probably concrete or a rubber mat, on top of a, con a concrete slat, a gang slat sitting on top of a rubber mat, on top of your liner, uh, and you're running it down. Put a barrier like that so you don't actually go too far. Next slide. Uh, how deep? I'm not going to go there. People think you can make lagoons. That guy's made them. 
think about how you have to get it out and what you're pumping out with. So three, four, five meters tops. But then if you go on three or four meters, you may need to be three meters at the top for this weight. Next slide. Uh, there's that plenty of weight and compacted and you build it up in layers and you compact each layer. Okay. And there's my idea of getting slurry out up and over with a pipe and that guy put it down and it feeds through the barrier, the barrel you see at the bottom. And that's what's, what's anchored it. And he sucks and he blows. And the barrel is sitting, it's a plastic barrel sitting on top of the liner. Uh, it's filled with concrete or rock. And you could have a couple of those if you wanted and use that as a means to pump the slurry around. Okay, next slide. Um, if you are going to, you need a double valve. If you're going through the wall, some people actually pump through. Uh, but remember, you need a double valve that's one meter apart, and you also need to protect that double valve because it looks good there. But whenever the grass and everything grows, you don't want a tractor coming along there and snapping that. Okay, next slide. And finally, that's my last slide. The positives. Stephen mentioned the valuable source is for fertilizer. I have a kind of rule of thumb, a thousand gallons of, of fairly typical 5% dry matter slurry, one third water, two thirds slurry is equivalent in available nutrients to 108 an acre of a 5428 fertilizer. But you have to store it safe and use it wisely. Okay. Thanks very much, Seamus. Um, a really important topic, maybe something that, that uh, we should cover more and be more aware of. So, uh, no, really appreciate you coming on tonight. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to move very quickly to, to Q&A, um, but I'm also conscious that uh, the, the consultation that we have been promoting in the, the series is, is now shut. Um, I was just wondering, Stephen, if I, if I could bring you back on. Do we have a sense of what the what the initial thoughts are? Has there been time to let the dust settle from the consultation? Do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, we're, we're waiting to hear, hear from the uh, Scottish Government on that. Uh, obviously, the consultation is a Scottish Government consultation, and they will be going through the <clears throat> what responses they've received, and will be responding to those uh, consultation responses in due course. Uh, I think it'll probably be, as it, as it only closed yesterday, they're probably taking stock of uh, the, those responses and uh, some of the press coverage that uh, the NFPS have got uh, those particular responses. So I would think it'd be a couple of weeks before we uh, get anything coming out and hearing more about what's, what things are going. Brilliant. Okay, oh, no problem. I think, um, Seamus, you're, you're back with us now. Um, we'll, we'll just go to the, to the Q&A if that's all right. Yep. Yeah, uh, we've got a few different questions in. Um, the first one I'm going to put to to Stephen. I think it. I think you kind of covered it in in your in your talk, really. All of these, but it's it's no harm going over it again. Someone asked, how often is routine, um, and is it something that we should be doing ourselves, uh, or should we be getting someone else out? And they just added in that they've got a, a new store alongside an older store. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the the guy that works guidance comes from the, the Syria the construction industry experts. They provide uh, guidance on agricultural uh, facilities and storage facilities. It's mostly written by ADAS. Uh, and their recommendation is that uh, you should be looking at an external visual inspection of stores once a year. Uh, and the above ground stores, the inside of an above ground store once every five years. That's a visual inspection. So it's, it's a walk around. It's uh, looking at the mastic. It's looking or pinholes, as Seamus had said, signs of rust, uh, maybe a, a little bolt, uh, an oily sheen, which is the start of electrolytic corrosion, uh, or just a wee chip in the enamel, and uh, try and look at repairing those, uh, putting you know, even, uh, bitumen mastic over the top of them, just to prevent any uh, additional rust uh, occurring. So in essence, it's, it, it, it'd be around about once a year. There are the slurry store manufacturers, uh, especially the above ground slurry store manufacturers, permastore and store, do have a an inspection program, uh, which uh, a farmer can take on board. Uh, they would usually do it, uh, a visual inspection, uh, it's a slight a small visual inspection once a year, but a more detailed inspection every five years. So is it maybe something that you should go, you should definitely do your inspection every year. And then if you do see something that you're not 100% sure of, then you might get on to the manufacturer or something and, and get them to come out and look at it at that stage. Yeah, that, that's what I would look at, Seamus, uh, that particular aspect. A lot of the, the inspections, the visual inspections of uh, old and new storage, a farmer can undertake himself. 
and they're going to identify if issues that he can deal with himself. Uh, even a small pinhole, he can deal with that quite easily by maybe pulling it a little bit further and putting a nut and bolt to it, which has got plenty of mastic around it, and that will seal the problem. Uh, if a panel is badly damaged, then it's more likely they're going to need the manufacturer to help with that particular one. Yeah, that's grand. Um, we have another question then um, on uh, temporary storage bags. So what are the rules around temporary storage bags? Uh, slurry bags are uh, pillow tanks or whatever you want to call them. Uh, they still have to comply with the SAFA regulations. So the bag itself needs to be designed to have a minimum design life of 20 years. Uh, most of these are PVC or uh, a synthetic liner. Uh, and they do have a finite lifespan. Uh, before Seville was uh, attacked by criminals, uh, cyber attack, I was actually working with a couple of uh, slurry bag manufacturers uh, to get more detail on durability and the lifespan of these particular structures. We are aware that some contractors do use them as like slave tanks. Uh, so they're, they are very, very temporary. They're only there for one or two days. Uh, the help the, uh, the application of the story that was filling and came straight away. Uh, but we are looking at them, and within the consultation that was out uh, for the change to the SAFA regulations, it talked about the, the introduction of study bags and the use of study bags uh, in future to allow that to, to be used on agricultural settings. Uh, the one thing I would say is that even with the study bag, uh, the industry standard would be that it would have to be contained uh, within a mark bank uh, structure. Uh, to maintain it, uh, to avoid damage, because they are susceptible to damage quite easily. Uh, and yeah, it is a 20 year design. Like. Yeah. I think sighting often as well, Steve, Stephen, would be important. You don't just actually put them somewhere it's handy, but it happens to be close to a ditch. Yes, sighting is very important. Mm -hmm. There's one more question here about what to do, what, what the first thing to do when you are looking at where you can save it's a grey water on the farm. So I assume what the question is asking is, wh where do you start when you're looking to uh, reduce the amount of water, unnecessary water going to your slurry storage? Right. Uh, two, two, two answers to that one. Basically, uh, you could contact your consultant uh, and go through that particular line, or you can contact Super and we can deal with it through the the, reg the SAPA regulations and identify what areas on the farm setting could drain to a constructive farm wetland and what areas actually necessary have to drain to a study store and provide mm -hmm. the advice on that. So uh, two options are there, uh, more than happy and nine times out of ten, uh, both the consultant and SAPA will be uh, on farm at, you know, at the same time talking about the yeah. same issues. We did do a big one. I had three, three large silage pits but they were never all open at the one time. He also had a lane coming down that the cows used to track and by watching what we were doing and diverting water at a certain time, we actually managed to save, I think it was like 240,000 gallons of water and yeah. that was able to go down. I would always start off round the steading, take a good walk around the steading and check, keep your clean water clean. Mm -hmm. And then if you've got open yards, decide just how dirty will they become. And if it's just a temp if it's a yard that you're only using on a temporary basis for handling cattle, um, I think people give a relaxation on that. If it's a yard that's been used every time for bringing cows in and out, then you needn't be gathering that water. And you size the tank accordingly, or you roof it, is the other side of the coin. You might look at even putting, um, some of people starting looking at plastic roofs over, but um, that's your options. But if you, if you then have to collect it, you then have to make sure that you've got the store big enough to allow you to do that. Yeah. Uh, it's probably, probably like, I suppose you could start off with just walk in the steading with that in right. mind yeah. and having a look yeah. to see where what yeah. gutters are up that your gutters are functioning and that kind yeah. of thing yeah it, it, in essence the farmer can do it himself shame as he can get the four point plan exactly take exactly. the four point plan of the farmer uh, website from the farming and water scotland website take the four point down the four point plan and you can actually go through uh, a drainage uh, inspection on a steading to identify mm -hmm. clean and dirty areas and then calculate how much dirty water needs to go to your study store and what you can then do with your clean water. That lightly contaminated grey area, if a farmer is considering a constructive farm and that is mitten drainage, uh, rainfall onto mittens and rainfall onto silage pits, then they can remove that and take it to the constructive farm button uh, and then take it to the study store. Mm -hmm. 
And if you can, if you're building a constructed wetland, we've had probably I don't know eight or nine, well, no, about half a dozen farmers have built them about five, six, seven years ago. And the, the key rules there are design them. They have to be at least the water area, the, the treatment area has to be twice the area of the dirty catchment you're trying to collect. And you feed that into four, a minimum of four ponds. And the first pond should be a, a wee bit deeper. Uh, it acts almost like a septic tank and it will gather out most of the big nutrients. And then that spills over into your next ponds and they should just be shallow. You're talking maybe about 18 inches. They are constructed. It's a wetland you're designing. But you for some reason, you need these four, four seams of magic number, at least four ponds. And by the time you get to the last pond, all you're looking to do is skim off the top inch of clean water. That's the water that has got the most exposure to ultraviolet light. It should stay, it should have burned out a lot of the pathogens. And you, you let that travel each time. What we've also done to try and improve that is put fingers within the pond so that the water has to take a tortuous route round, like an S, all the way. And that just makes it slower to actually go through the pond. And, and gives a chance then for, so you water it rather than just in at the, big, at the beginning of the pond and out at the bottom, you're actually making it forcing it to actually take a wee bit of time and deposit a lot more of the, the fine particles and what have you. Yeah, well, you, you must have read one of the attendees' minds there because you answered the next question, which is how big do the constructive farm wetlands need to be? Um, but it, that that comes down to scale. It's it's all about what you're collecting and what's what you collect. Like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, um. That's that's all the questions then. Um. Alex and I think we're nearly just about. Over. Yeah. It's only two minutes over, so it's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. So so conscious of the fact we've we've just hit nine o'clock, so um I will just move on and we'll wind down. Um. So thank you everybody for for joining us this evening. Um, as I said at the very beginning, this is part three in our four-part series. Um, if you have missed um, any of the webinars to date, um, you can find the recordings at the Farming and Water Scotland uh, website. And uh, please, by all means, get in touch with Farming and Water Scotland. We're always keen to hear um, your thoughts and your feedback. Um, engage with us on, on Twitter and Facebook. We're, we're always looking for, for good stories. Um, in terms of the fourth webinar, we are having a specialist panel night next week, same time, eight o'clock, uh, with all of the returning speakers uh, from the, the series. So we will be taking your questions and looking at some of the good news stories um, that we've amassed here in Ayrshire. Um, so yeah, I, I just thanks uh, ever so much for, for joining us again and uh, look forward to next week. I mentioned at the very beginning, this is part of a Farming and Water Scotland webinar series. Farming and Water Scotland is a joint initiative between SAC and SEPA, and we aim to provide uh, important resources and information to help farmers and landowners enhance the water environment in Scotland. So if any of you have any questions regarding diffuse pollution and um, livestock, nutrient use um, or funding, um, you can uh, you can use the Farming and Water Scotland website um, for for as your one stop shop. All right, so thanks very much uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, we hope to see as many of you as possible for next week for for our grand finale. And uh, yeah, good night and thanks very much. Okay, good night. Okay.